Strange Studies of Strange Stories. There's no use trying to describe either Unthorhorsten or his surroundings. Because, for one thing, a good many million years had passed since 1942 Anno Domini. And, for another, Unthorhorsten wasn't on Earth, technically speaking. He was doing the equivalent of standing in the equivalent of a laboratory. He was preparing to test his time machine. That was the opening of Mimsy Were the Borgoves by Lewis Paget, first published in February 1943, issue of Astounding Science Fiction magazine. Can you imagine reading a time machine story in 1943? <laughs> well, they're just going to come back and kill Hitler. You used to get maybe a Roman orgy or something fun in these time machine stories, but they're all present day now. <laughs> you, audience, are joining us here on Strange Studies of Strange Stories. I'm Chris Lackey. I am Chad Pfeiffer, and Lewis Paget has something in common with us in that this author is two people. Uh, yeah, Lewis Paget is the pseudonym for writers Henry Cutler. Cutner and C.L. Moore, the husband-wife team. We've talked about these guys mm-hmm. before. We covered them both individually on H.P. Podcraft. Cutner wrote The Graveyard Rats, and C.L. Moore wrote Chamblow. Speaking of familiar voices, whose was that readers? That is the amazing Greg Johnson making his debut appearance on Strange Studies of Strange Stories. It is his debut. He has so much stuff going on, I can't even keep track of it all. But you can by following him on Twitter and YouTube and also Instagram. He's been making lots of cool props lately. That's his thing that he's been doing. Beautiful stuff. Go check him out. Willie the show notes to Greg's YouTube page and Twitter. Check out what he's doing. Whatever he's doing, I guarantee it's classic Greg. (laughs) Just to remind folks, this is our free show for August. If you subscribe on Patreon, you get a new show every week on all the best classic genre fiction, plus a show on listener feedback, plus an extra credit episode. And on the bonus episode this month, I think we'll talk a little about Alice in Wonderland. Just because somehow I've never read those books and I've never actually seen the movies either. I've seen the Disney film. A lot of that in imagery is very well known. Mm-hmm. It's pop culture stuff. You know, the White Rabbit with the pocket watch, the Cheshire Cat, the, the Queen of Hearts, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Yeah, it's one of those things where you feel like you've seen it, but I never sat down to watch the movie. I know all the references. In fact, last night I was watching the new Hellboy, finally catching up. <laughs> new. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's from a while ago, but the latest gritty reboot of that. Yes. And it uh-huh. uh, was referencing Alice in Wonderland. The one thing I am familiar with is the nonsense poem Jabberwocky, mm. which is from Through the Looking Glass, the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Yeah. We're talking about all of this, of course, because the title of today's story is a quote from the first stanza of that poem. Oh. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borough goves, and the moam wraths outgrabe." You know what? I'll read the whole poem on the bonus episode. It's it's not that long. Oh. And it's a nonsense poem, although when you read it, you know exactly what's going on, which is such an inch. I think that's why it really has gotten into folk zeitgeist, and it's why we read it in freshman English, uh, mm. because it uses portmanteau, which is the combining of words to make new words. We do this, you know, breakfast and lunch becomes brunch mm-hmm. or motor and hotel becomes motel. It's something that happens in language anyway. And so when you're reading it, you feel like you could almost decode the nonsense words in there to make words that you do know. Mm-hmm. Some of them are also definitely nonsense. Nevertheless, you can follow the action and you know what's going on. It's about monster fighting, which is very primal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. I loved it when I read it back then. And that was the poem actually that came up in, in Hellboy. Now we're reading this today because we wanted to start the month with some good science fiction. And this one was judged by the Science Fiction Writers of America to be among the best science fiction stories written prior to 1965. It was included in the anthology, the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 1 from 1970. And it's also the basis for the 2007 film, The Last Mimsy. Have you seen or heard of that movie? I have heard of it but I have never seen it. But I have listened to a bit of William Shatner reading this story, which you can find on YouTube. Oh, really? Honestly, it's not great. He reads huh. it really quickly, and I feel like he's not really paying attention to the... Yeah. Like, he's hitting all the words, but I don't think he understands what's happening or what it's about, or, like, somebody just goes, here, read this, and yes. he read it <laughs> like Shatner reads, and, you know... What do you got me doing today? What is this? Mimsy, fine, whatever, let's go. <laughs> 
When I heard the title for the film, I would never have known it was related to Jabberwocky. No. I thought it was about a rare flower or something, honestly, yeah. because I never saw a trailer. Now that I know it's an adaptation of this, I definitely, I think they changed the plot quite a bit, but certainly I'm interested in it because I thought this story was super cool. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it going in, but no. I really liked it. So uh, let's let's study this Frumius Bandersnatch. The story begins with an entity named Utha Horsten, who is millions of years in the future and somehow outside of Earth. They don't really explain it. They're don't even try to explain it because he is so far beyond our comprehension that yeah. that they use things like in the beginning. It's, it's something like a laboratory doing something like an experiment. We, we can't get our heads around it because it's so far beyond us. This being has created a time machine, a small box of some kind, and it wants to test it out. He realizes just as the box starts up, the Horston, that, oh, I should probably put something inside of this so that when it returns, I can test the item to see if my time machine worked. It said, quote, a solid in the box would automatically be subject to the entropy and cosmic ray bombardment of another era, and Utha Horston could measure those changes, both qualitative and quantitative, when the machine returned. So he quickly gathers up some of his son's discarded toys and puts them in a box. It disappears and doesn't come back for a long time. So he builds a second one and drops more toys in it. This one also disappears. He believes that he sent it to the latter part of the 19th century, but can't confirm it because it doesn't come back either. So since both experiments failed to work, he is tired of it and quits. It's a great setup, it says, but the mischief had been done. And with the Horston in that section is described as a little childlike on his own, which sounds like a dig. But as this goes on, you realize that's actually saying something else yes. about him. But in a childlike manner... I tried these experiments. They didn't work out. Who cares about the consequences? I'm just going to move on. So even that intro is saying something a little bit about science and experimentation. Uh -huh. There are unforeseen consequences for these things, and we're going to see what those consequences are. We cut back to 1942, where Scott Paradine, a seven-year-old boy, finds this box. He's skipping school. He's got a geography test that day. And this was the only reference to the war. By the way, Hitler doesn't get killed in this story. Oh. The only reference to the war at all, it says Scott saw no sense in memorizing place names, which in 1942 was a fairly sensible theory because <laughs> the whole world's about to change and get yeah. cut up into all sorts of different ways. So he decides to skip school. He's having a bunch of snacks out in this field when he just sees the box sort of tumbling down the bank along a creek. The language of the story is pretty playful in a very alien and analytical way. About noon, he got hungry, so his stocky legs carried him to a nearby store. There, he invested his small hoard with penurious care and the sublime disregard for his gastric juices. <laughs> it went down by the creek to feed. So junk food. <laughs> but the way that it's described, you know, yeah. you have to sort of uh, translate it a bit in your head. And again, like, it's this type of writing that makes it hard, I think, for Shatner to know what he's doing. Like, when he's yeah. reading this thing, he's he's reading all the words correctly again, but... This is nothing but sabotages for William Shatner. <laughs> Uh, you say Mimsy, I say Mimsy. That's the way I say it. Don't don't correct me. Don't tell me how to say Mimsy. <laughs> it sickens me. He grabs the box up and he tries to open it, but it's weird. The gadgetry would have given Einstein a headache. The kid, it's kind of funny. So the reason that he can't get this thing open is it's a bizarre mechanism, but also it's not entirely in that space-time continuum yet. It's somehow in between spaces. Yeah. And he just knocks it open with a rock, which is great. <laughs> that actually brings it into his current 1942 time and opens up the box. A bunch of things fall out. There's like a soft helmet, a few other things that aren't described, but he's immediately captivated by a square, transparent crystal block, small enough to cup in his palm. The crystal was a sort of magnifying glass, vastly enlarging the things inside the block. Strange things they were, too. Miniature people. They moved like clockwork automatons though much more smoothly. The tiny people are building a house and he wishes for it to catch fire. He just wants to see what they would do. And then it does catch fire. And then the people start running around and they put out the fire. And then Scott's able to figure out that he actually can control this thing with his mind. It scares him at first. Obviously, when this device came out, I was thinking of it right away like a smartphone. It's got these little people that can control in there and it's a little glass and holds it in his hand. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm not sure who the comedian was that said it, but it was something along the lines of YouTube makes us all into mini Roman emperors. <laughs> The fact that we have this control, you can be like, for my amusement, I would like to see a duck and a bear make friends in a swimming pool. <laughs> and you'll find that. Yes. I have this odd sensation I'm sure people can relate to where sometimes I'm watching an old movie and someone will pick up. I think they have a smartphone in the movie. They'll pick up a, a cigarette box from the counter or something along those lines. It's in their hand. It's just so in there now that I can't help but see that. Yeah. Now, it becomes clear that these are no ordinary toys. Scott gets invested in them as he's looking through the box. And there's not much detail 
about what they all do. It just says, he found some really remarkable gadgets. The afternoon passed all too quickly. Scott finally put the toys back in the box and logged it home. He inherently knows he might not want to show these to his parents right away, so he hides the whole box in his closet. His two-year-old sister, Emma, comes in and asks for help tying her shoes. Downstairs, his father, Dennis Paradine, and his mother, Jane, are having cocktails. Dad's a philosophy teacher. This is a very cocktail culture uh, story. Yeah. It feels very of that time. They're having martinis. Jane al always is taking his olives. Apparently she likes those martinis extra dirty. Yeah. And there's this bizarre conversation, to bizarre to me, about one of his students. He says, you sound like one of my students. And she says, like that hussy Betty Dawson, perhaps? Does she still leer at you in that offensive way? She does. The child is a neat psychological problem. Luckily, she isn't mine. Sex consciousness and too many movies. I suppose she still thinks she can get a passing grade by showing her knees, which are, by the way, rather bony. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like a fairly normal conversation. <laughs> I mean, well, it's a husband-wife team, and I imagine that they're spicing this up with their cocktail conversation. Oh. I mean, obviously what's happening is that he's got students who are trying to flirt with him to get a grade. Mm -hmm. And I think he's saying, if that were my daughter, I'd punish her for this. But it does come off as a little weird, the way he says it. They feel like a pretty normal family, except there is reference to their maid, yeah. who's making them dinner and taking care of things. So mm -hmm. his job as a philosophy teacher at this university is pretty cushy. That's a, one thing that might have been better in the mid-century. <laughs> yeah, we get a sense through this conversation that they love their kids. And they're very proud of them. But at dinner, Dennis, the dad, notices that Scott isn't eating much. And he normally does, but his son says, well, I've had all I need. And he kind of explains he's eating his food in a different way, using his saliva to get more nutrition out of it so he can eat less. Dennis yeah. says, well, that's rather a revolutionary idea, but this one might not be so far off the beam. He pursed his lips. Eventually, I suppose people will eat quite differently. I mean, the way they eat, as well as what, what they eat, I mean. Jane, our son shows signs of becoming a genius. Mm -hmm. So at least these kids are in the right household yeah. where some of these things are going to be recognized and appreciated. Later, after dinner, Dennis notices his son playing with one of these toys. It's a tesseract strung with beads. And he asks, is that an abacus? You describe it as a tesseract. Is that you bringing something to it? Did it say that? The result resembled a tesseract strung with beads. Oh, wow. Because if somebody told me it was a tesseract, I don't even know what that is. I, I know that word from A Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, well, a tesseract, I can explain it. It's a fourth dimensional cube. So... Mm -hmm. So a square is two-dimensional, a cube yeah. is three-dimensional, and a tesseract, what it looks like, it's often represented as it's a cube within a cube, and it's got lines going to each side. The best way to understand it is that if you think of a square, each corner is joined by two lines. And if you think of a cube, each corner is connected by three lines. And if you think of a tesseract or four dimensionals, it's each corner's got four lines coming off of it. Uh, I'm experiencing what the father experienced looking at the toy. I'm going, uh-huh. Oh, very interesting. And in my head, I could just hear you singing Wuthering Heights. That's all that's happening. <laughs> well, the kid brings this device over to his dad, and the, he, it says, the framework itself, Paradine wasn't a mathematician, but the angles formed by the wires were vaguely shocking in their ridiculous lack of Euclidean logic. Non-Euclidean. That's right. We brought a Lovecraftian concept over into the new show. What do you think about that? That's exciting. Scott, he lies to his father. He says, uh, Uncle Harry gave it to me. Scott said on the spur of the moment, last Sunday when he came over. And now he knows his uncle won't be back for a few weeks to be questioned about this gift, the lie will give him time to mess around with these toys without too many questions. They never get into the character of Uncle Harry. He must be kind of the fun uncle, you know, yeah. where they're like, well, if someone's going to give my kids non-Euclidean toys, it's probably <laughs> Harry. <laughs> and his dad can't get these beads to work, so he just gives the toy back to Scott. And we get hints that it's actually an educational toy because yeah. Scott gets these little stings when he's doing it wrong. So it's using a kind of a reinforcement to mm -hmm. get him to do the right thing with it. And gradually he actually solves the puzzle. It makes one bead jump to another wire and there should be like no way for that to happen. Uh -huh. And then the bead can disappear and come back. He tries to present this to his father to show that he's won. And his dad's like, I guess you did. What did you win? I don't understand the result. So he gives this abacus to his sister and instead starts working on that crystal cube, which it turns out is also educational. Scott checks out the little people in the crystal. They build a house. There's a fire. He yells for them to put it out. As he thinks about it, a fire engine comes in and puts out the fire like he had done before. It says, this was fun, like putting on a play, only more real. The little people did what Scott told them inside of his head. If he made a mistake, they waited until he found the right way. They even posed new problems for him. 
So later, Scott lets his sister go through the box and she starts carrying around this weird doll. And Scott says that their uncle gave them this as well. Emma brought the doll to her mother. She comes apart. See? Oh, it... Ugh! Jane sucked in her breath. Paradine looked up quickly. What's up? She brought the doll over to him, hesitated, and then went into the dining room, giving Paradine a significant glance. He followed, closing the door. Jane had already placed the doll on the cleared table. This isn't very nice, is it, Denny? Hmm. It was rather unpleasant at first glance. One might have expected an anatomical dummy in a medical school, but a child's doll. The thing came apart in sections. Skin, muscles, organs. Miniature, but quite perfect, as far as Paradine could see. That's shocking enough that mm. this doll can come apart and show you the inside of the body, but they soon find that it's not perfect, actually. There's there's little variations. Yeah, the way the body's laid out. And it has some kind of extra nerve network. Some kind of thing that we don't know about. He says, I guess I could see how this works, but it's, it's obviously something that medical folks don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. Paradigm's mistake was that he didn't get rid of the toys. He did not realize their significance. And by the time he did, the progression of circumstances had got well underway. <laughs> Very foreboding. What, Scott asked his father one evening, is a wave, dad? Now, we recognize that word wave from Jabberwocky, mm -hmm. but for his dad, he's like, I don't know, Scottish for web? I, I, <laughs> I, I can't figure out what you're asking me. Clearly, the kid is trying to work something out. It says Scott was learning fast. Had Scott realized that his education was being guided and supervised, probably wouldn't have been into it. But as it was, his initiative was never quashed. So it's the great thing about educational toys is that you're having fun the whole time so you don't even realize you're, learning you're being instructed on a system of thought. These kids are continuing to use the toys and because the thoughts of children are so alien to adults, the parents don't really notice how it's changing them. I mean, they're weird anyway. So how would you know yeah. that they're learning about extra dimensional stuff. And because Emma is younger than Scott even, she's learned even less about how the world works. And as a result, the toys are impacting her even more. Mm. We've talked about this on the show plenty of times about how to children, anything's possible because they haven't learned the rules of the world yet. So yeah. they might not react to a ghost or something scary in the same way that you would. And this story just exploits that concept to the max, man. Yeah. They even have developed some kind of odd language between them. They're exchanging notes that look like these gibberish symbols. The dad runs them by a college who says, well, here's a free translation of these symbols, Dennis. Quote, I don't know what this means, but I kid the hell out of my father with it. Unquote. He thinks that the kids are just pranking dad. Yeah. So finally, enough odd things happen that the parents question the kids and Scott gives it up. The toys aren't from the uncle and he found them by the creek. Jane's also gotten suspicious, especially because one of the neighbors complained, your kid showed my kid a toy and it scared her. You know, something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah. And she's checking around town and these toys aren't coming from any normal store. Uh -huh. Since they know the uncle didn't give them to the kids and that the, they were just found, he wants to get down to the origin of what they might be. And so he goes, you know what? I know a child psychologist from the school, Rex Holloway. I'm going to run these by him and see what he mm -hmm. thinks. So the couple meet Rex Holloway, who quickly recognizes the strangeness of the toys and suspects them to be of extraterrestrial origin. Holloway figures out the toys are educating the children and introducing an X factor into their thought process, such as geometry that's unrelated to or incompatible with Euclidean geometry or non-Euclidean geometry. He believes their developing young minds are pliable enough to be profoundly affected by these devices. And I like what Rex says here. He says, all children are mad from an adult viewpoint. <laughs> Babies, of course, are not human. They're animals. They have a very ancient and ramified culture, as cats have, and fishes, and even snakes. The same in kind as these, but much more complicated and vivid, since babies are, after all, one of the most developed species of the lower vertebrates. In short, babies have minds which work in terms and categories of their own, which cannot be translated into terms and categories of the human mind. It's really interesting. It, it's that conversation of if that cat could speak, what would it say to you? You think nothing I could understand because it's not like there's just communication they can't do. They are thinking about the world in terms that we don't think about. Yeah. Most animals have a little organ in their throats that allow them to sense chemicals 
in the air that tell that's why a dog can sniff out a tumor or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. And we don't have that. So we don't even know that language that they're communicating with. The psychologist says the brain's a very complicated machine. We don't know much about its potentialities. We don't even know how much it can grasp, but it is known that the mind becomes conditioned as the human animal matures. Mm-hmm. Hardening of the thought arteries, Jane interjected. Jane's there to occasionally make this simple for the rest of us, I yes. guess. But this was fascinating, this idea that babies aren't like stupid. They have co- just completely alien thought processes. Yeah. And it's true. If you sit there looking at a kid, it's looking around. Things are going on in its mind. We have no idea what's going on there. Mm. Holloway comes to a conclusion. If the undeveloped minds have been tuned into the X channel, it's necessary to divert them back. And I'm not saying that's the wisest thing to do, but it probably is from our standards. After all, Emma and Scott will have to live in this world. There was something about that that was a little heartbreaking. You know, there are so many things that cause pain in society that are completely created because of adult stuff that's been put onto it. And a lot of times kids learn those things, prejudices, because sure. their parents are saying, well, it's not that I want them to believe that, but I want them to know about it because this is the world they have to live in. Uh-huh. And just in the execution of that, it keeps that prejudice going. Yeah. Holloway convinces the Paradigm parents to take the toys away from the children so that the children can return to normal development. And he attempts to study the toys himself, but has very little success. Meanwhile, the children continue thinking in the new patterns and communicating with each other in strange ways, including in their sleep and using strange words. The little girl makes some odd noises in her sleep, and just like how her brother was eating food differently, the father is really chilled thinking, have their minds changed so that even sleep was different to them? Mm. They're, they're running that sleep cycle in a different way to maximize it? Sure. And, and the child psychologist seems to be kind of alarmist about all this, too. He was having the toys tested. He drew endless charts and diagrams corresponding with mathematicians, engineers, and other psychologists. He's quietly going crazy trying to find rhyme and reason in the construction of the gadgets. In a Lovecraft story, I feel like we'd be with that child psychologist the whole time. Yeah who's slowly going insane. But instead, this takes a very heartfelt, more family approach. That's what I think is unique about this story. Yeah. The kids are still behaving fairly normal, but as we go on, there's little signs of them developing unusual thought patterns as a result of interacting with these toys. There's one conversation that Scott and his dad have about how salmon reproduce, and Scott thinks it would be natural for a species to send its eggs upstream in a river to hatch, and then the young would choose to return to the ocean when they're sufficiently developed. This example that he's giving when they have this conversation kind of gives some insight into what might be happening with our opening guy who invented the time machines. Mm. We don't know where Untha Horsten is, but he doesn't really care much about using the toys in his time machine box because it says some of the discarded toys of his son Snowin, which the boy had brought with him when he had passed over from Earth after mastering the necessary technique. So I think that his son's talking about that. Mm. This world is just where the eggs get sent to sort of develop a little bit, and then they pass from this earth back to where their Untha Horsten was in the the beginning. There's some kind of non-Euclidean way to just leave what we see entirely. Right, yeah. And that's what these toys are teaching them about. (laughs) Wow, okay, yeah. I didn't quite get that from this. (laughs) Yeah. That's crazy. That's neat. So so cool. Once out of their parents' view, Scott begins collecting and creating small items for an abstract machine. Largely at Emma's direction and guidance, she has more knowledge about how to construct the machine, but she doesn't have this actual skill to be able to do it. He's been more in the world, so he'll know how to get the materials they need. But in terms of the abstract thinking, you got to go with the two-year-old because that's (laughs) the unbound mind that hasn't been, been embracing these toys and probably gets the concepts better. Yeah. And as we're dealing with this, we cut away for a moment. It says, in the latter half of the 19th century, an Englishman sat on a grassy bank near a stream, a very small girl lying next to him, staring up at the sky. She had discarded a curious toy with which she'd been playing and now was murmuring a wordless little song to which the man listened with half an ear. What was that, my dear? He asked at last. Just something I made up, Uncle Charles. Sing it again. He pulled out a notebook. The girl obeyed. Does it mean anything? She nodded. Oh, yes. Like the stories I tell you, you know. As the inventor thought, that second box that he threw more toys into went back to 19th century England. Mm -hmm. It was found by this child who is implied to be Alice Liddell, Mm -hmm. who who, who recited this verse, which we can 
imply is Jabberwocky, mm-hmm. that she somehow learned from the toys that she got, the other educational toys. And she is talking to her uncle Charles, who's Charles Dodgson, who's better known as Lewis Carroll. So this is stuff that you might need to know going in reading it. Yeah. So when he asked her the meaning and she's, she says something along the lines of it's, a, it's the way out. So again, it's this earth is some kind of spawning place and you pass away from it. And Alice is looking at that and going, oh, this is a map for me to get out of here. Mm-hmm. So he's based on these toys and all the stuff she comes up with. He's going to fictionalize the Alice in Wonderland thing. But this group of verse, he, just, he says, I like the way that sounds right as it is. And that's the reason we get this nonsense poem. Mm-hmm. It actually comes from that distant future. That section ends with this Alice girl was already too old yeah. and she never completed this a journey to wherever she wants to go. She never found the way. Unfortunately or fortunately, Alice's brain is too hardwired by her age and the influence that society's had on her. So she can't do what needs to be done. She got the toys too late. Right. But her uncle published that poem. Yes. So it has passed on into mm-hmm. the present day of this story. So back in 1942, Scott and Emma have encountered Carol's fantasy book through the looking glass containing the poem Jabberwocky. In its words, they identify the time space equation that guides their production, organization, and operation of their abstract machine. So one day, their father hears the children's cries of excitement from upstairs in the house, and he arrives in the doorway of Scott's bedroom. It says, The children were vanishing, they went in fragments like thick smoke in the wind, or like movement in a distorting mirror. Hand in hand they went, in a direction Paradigm could not understand. And as he blinked there on the threshold, they were gone. The kids are completely gone. On the carpet, there's a pattern of markers, pebbles, an iron ring, just basically junk that seems to be in a random pattern. But there's this crumpled sheet of paper there. He looks at it. It was a leaf torn from a book. There were interlineations, marginal notes, and Emma's meaningless scrawl, and a stanza of verse that had been underlined and scribbled over. But he knows it because he's familiar with Through the Looking Glass, and it's that opening stanza that I read at the top. And he realizes that this is a mathematical formula that gives all the conditions in symbolism that they had finally understood, together with the junk on the floor. This is like some dreams in the witch house stuff, basically. it is. I think earlier the kids were going, we need to make these toves slithy. So these things mean something. Yeah. They had to put them in a certain relationship so that they gyre and jimble. It hadn't been nonsense or lunacy to those kids because they learned that X logic. Mm-hmm. She had translated Lewis Carroll's words into symbols that she and Scott could understand, and that's what allowed them to pass on from this earth. Paradine made a rather ghastly little sound deep in his throat. He looked at the crazy pattern on the carpet, if he could follow it as the kids had done, but he couldn't. The pattern was senseless. The random factor defeated him. He was conditioned to Euclid. Even if he went insane, he still couldn't do it. It would be the wrong kind of lunacy. His mind had stopped working now. But in a moment, the stasis of incredulous horror would pass. Paradine crumpled the page in his fingers. Emma! Scotty! He called in a dead voice, as though he could expect no response. Sunlight slanted through the open windows, brightening the golden pelt of Mr. Bear. Downstairs, the ringing of the telephone began again. Mr. Bear was the name of the doll that the girl had. Mm -hmm. She had another doll named Mr. Bear, and so to her, all dolls were Mr. Bear, which was a kind of interesting comment within the story that because she didn't know to call these things dolls, she just called them all what one of them was called. So it shows you how children will elasticize concepts. Well, yeah, when I was a kid, my grandmother had a dog named Pepper, Mm -hmm. and I believed all animals were pepper. So I called animals pepper. Exactly. That's the end of the story. I think that that's such an amazing take on something we covered ad nauseum on the old show, which is, Mm. wow, there's going to be concepts that are so alien to your mind. You can't even understand them, blah, blah, blah. And this takes that, which maybe it was just a thought exercise in we all call Jabberwocky nonsense first, but what if it really means something Mm -hmm. and turns it into this thing that I think, like any good strange story does, makes you think about things in your own life, primarily technology being passed to kids and how they use it. In linguistics, you know, children will make something grammatical. That's how we get a Creole out of a pigeon. Right, right. When two people of different languages kind of come up with some way to communicate with each other, a child will instantly make that grammatical. So if you have two parents who had to learn sign language later in life, that child learning the sign language will be better at it than them and will understand its inherent structure. And this is taking that 
I, we all, as you get older, you start feeling disconnected because things that you had to learn how to use are just already there for the kids. So they're going to be better with the internet and they're going to be better with the smartphones. And that's also being addressed in this story is that mm -hmm. feeling of the new generation having a whole different set of guidelines and signposts that have been knocked down. And you don't understand that world. Well, and there's also the other aspect to it. I mean, his kids go away. They're gone, mm -hmm. which is also another thing as a parent, I think about your kids growing past you, getting better than you, surpassing you, and then, you know, going on with their own lives. Yeah. Obviously, this kid's only two and uh, what, Scott's 10? I think he's around seven. Seven. Yeah. So, yeah, the, obviously really small kids and to thinking that my kids would just go off into some alternate dimension, it would be pretty upsetting to me. But I guess yeah. they're ready for it because they're doing it. Yeah, they're excited when they're they're cheering when they figure it out. <laughs> it plays on a lot of themes besides the, the cool sci-fi aspect of it. It's just about being an, a parent, being an adult and how you feel obsolete. Eventually, you're going to be obsolete. That's just the nature of life. You start off. You adapt, you grow, you get stronger, and then there's that downward descent. Hopefully you get a little wisdom, but eventually that fades too, and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I find interesting is you know that your kids are going to rebel against you in some way. Sure. But the form, or maybe not even rebel, but that they're going to have a different thing that's going to shock you in some way. Yeah. You just don't know what the shape of it's going to be. And I think that people assume the rebellion is going to be also something they know. So I'm going to, when my kids are teenagers, I'm going to have to deal with them wanting to get out in their cars and race or... <laughs> do drugs or whatever it is they're going to do. But, you know, I yeah. know so many parents now who are going, I didn't foresee that gender stuff would be what I'm dealing with. Yeah. Because the world's completely different now. Yeah. Young folks are building a world in which gender's a construct and sexuality's fluid. And this is almost all parents I know are grappling with that and they didn't see it coming. No. But when you're a child coming into this world, that's just all accepted. So you don't, you don't know what parents are even freaking out about because that's just the world that you're born into. Similarly, I'm always, I, I always thinking of things in before the smartphone and after the smartphone, mm -hmm. before social media and after social media, because I got to experience young adulthood without it and then yeah. with it. And for somebody, there's never not been a way to connect with people across the world. There's never not been a situation in which you can access all this video and information. For kids, what are they going to do with it? There was a comedian that said, before the internet, if you wanted to see a picture of a cat with sunglasses on, mm -hmm. you would have to go to the library, just kind of <laughs> hope that you would find a book. <laughs> Yeah. somewhere where there would be a picture of a cat with sunglasses on. Maybe the librarian would be able to hook you up with something or there might be some illustrations of it. But now you want to see a picture of a cat with sunglasses on? You're going to see thousands of them because of this technology that we have now. And not only that, soon you can just make the AI draw one up for you. You Proof. don't even have to find an existing photo of it. <laughs> yeah. It would be worth it to get a time travel machine to go back to the library and see the interaction where the guy shows up looking for... I'm sorry, I'm just looking for a picture of a cat with sunglasses. <laughs> what is this for? For a project? No, I just want to see it. <laughs> I don't have a cat. This is the only place I could go. <laughs> and then it takes it into the sci-fi realm by, by saying everything, geometry is a construct. Everything mm, yeah. that we, these guardrails go up and it makes us, maybe we get smarter in the education of what those guardrails are, but everything that we bound the universe with cuts off some kind of knowledge we might be privy to otherwise. And I love that concept that there's always more. You were talking about death, which is a bit of a downer, but we we have an understanding of what that is. You know, I'm not a spiritual or religious person, but it's always exciting to think there's just things that I don't know about. Sure. And that maybe we are going to ascend into wherever these Jabberwocky kids go. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just some other dimension. I'm not even seeing it because when you're on the inside of that house, that house is all there is. We're, we're bound by our box of brains and by the world we live in, but there, mm -hmm. there's so many things past that that we just don't know about. There was a bit of an uplift I felt to the story as well. You know, sort of like when Carl Sagan talks about in the multi, on the, in the multi universe, there's somewhere that his parents are still alive. There are ways to get science and this kind of creative thinking to reassure you. And I felt like that this story did a little of that. It's nice to know that there's things I don't know, not in the horrifying way for once. Yeah. I mean, it's sad that they lose their kids, but it, in the end, it came down to this. Oh, wow. Yeah. If you don't get the boundaries put up for you when you're a child, the world could be quite a different place. And that that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty amazing. It's pretty cool. Well, we're going to get into more science fiction next week, although I don't think this is quite as mind bending. I'm not sure. 
It's a story called Arena, not the Duran Duran album. And not the episode of the original series of Star Trek. Well, you know, it might be related, though. This is a story by Frederick Brown, and I know that it's about oh. some alien fighting. Oh, my God, it might be. Well, we'll find out. I haven't read it yet. I just yeah. started reading the beginning. We'll do some and research was, on it before we do the show. There was a guy naked in some blue sand, and that sounded okay to me. Yeah. So next week, we're going to talk about Arena. I think it's a little more of the action flavor, but this has been a great one. And then bonus, we're going to talk about Alice in Wonderland, and uh, we've got some other Alice theme stuff coming up. I want to thank Greg Johnson for his uh, premiere performance on Strange Studies, The Strange Stories. He did great as always. Had to have him on. You know, we've had Andrew and, and Heather and we had to get Greg on now and, and Rachel hopefully will be coming up soon. We got to Absolutely. get got to get all of our regulars in on the show as we're embarking on this new path. And uh, I'm glad to have Greg back. I love that guy. And with that, I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And you've been listening to Strange Studies of Strange Stories. At strangestudies.com and Patreon. Strange Studies of Strange Strange stories. Ah!